Hello and welcome to another Hollywood Wargaming episode for getting started into the miniature wargaming hobby. And in our last video, we talked about the tools that you're going to need to get started, which are essential to assembling and painting your models. But today we're going to dive in and look at the paints themselves, and I think this is definitely a topic that deserves its own video, because there are a lot of options out there and it can be quite overwhelming when you're first getting into the hobby. So, you've got your models, you've got them assembled and glued onto their bases, what now? How do you get started getting that color onto them and bringing them to life? And maybe more importantly, what do I need to buy to do that? And when you start painting models, the first thing you're always going to begin with is a spray of primer. Now, spray primer, often referred to as rattle cans, is spray on paint that's going to stick to that plastic coat, give a nice thin layer in which you can work on top of, and apply more paints to. If you try and paint models without priming them, your paints will not stick and it will be a disaster. Trust me, you absolutely cannot skip this phase. And while there are alternatives to rattle can primers, such as brush on primers or airbrush primers, I think most of the population out there really does prefer to use rattle cans. And for a good reason, for the most part they are very affordable, reliable, and gets you a nice even coat across the model. So I highly suggest you start here. And for most wargamers, they would recommend you just pick up a standard can of black spray paint or maybe a neutral gray. And that's fine if you have a large diversity of models and you just want to pick up one spray can that can work for all of them as a primer. I would highly recommend doing your research, looking at the predominant colors on your models, and buying a colored spray that correlates with the main color that you're going to need to be painting. For example, my Africa Corps uses Desert Yellow as the color for their khaki pants and their tan helmets. And because of that, I like to use Vallejo's Desert Yellow Color Spray as a primer and base coat for my models, which saves me a few coats that I would need to paint in those areas, as they are already the color that they need to be. A more extreme example of this would be me spraying my B1 Battle Droids for Star Wars Legion using Vallejo's Bone White Color. From there, all I need to do is paint the guns black, and the base colors for the model are more or less finished. Buying a spray color that correlates with your main color scheme is going to save you a ton of time on the painting table, and it's going to give you a nice, satisfying flat coat similar to something that you would get out of an airbrush. It's an awesome strategy that I recommend every tabletop gamer uses, and it will help get you more models painted on the table with a nice, clean coat of paint. But there are a few main options as far as brands go for what kind of color primer you can buy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I am in love with the new Vallejo Hobby Spray Paints. This stuff is only about six months old, and I gotta say, it is an absolute godsend. I adore this brand for putting this product out there. And before I continue gushing, I do need to say again, just like the last video, I am not sponsored or endorsed by any of the products in this video. These are all paints and products that I have bought with my own money and I'm recommending based on my own personal experience with them. But the Vallejo spray paint line absolutely is my favorite and is kind of a sweet middle ground in between the Citadel primer from Games Workshop and the Army Painter color primer selection. And I'll explain to you why by taking a look at the Citadel primer stuff first. And I really do like the Citadel primer, it is great quality. However, it's definitely on the expensive side, with cans costing upwards of $20. But the real drawback with these is that there is a very limited and specific color range line, and they tend to phase colors in and out relatively rapidly with these, which is a little concerning if you plan on having a collection over a long period of time. And some of the colors they do have tend to be a little bit off. For example, their Mechanicus Standard Gray isn't really a nice medium gray. It has this kind of weird greenish tint to it that I'm not a fan of. And while some of the other colors are perfect for things like Warhammer 40k or Age of Sigmar, they don't always translate over into other games, including other games in Games Workshop sometimes. Going back to that Mechanica Standard Grey, it's not something I would use to spray for, say, Grey Skaven fur. That being said, some of the colors they do have that are very specific are very, very good and very useful to have. For example, Lead Belcher is one of the best gunmetal silver tones, that you can use in model painting, and Games Workshop making a spray can of it really has saved me a lot of time on painting a lot of models. That being said, if you're just getting a flat black or a white spray paint, I would look elsewhere. But if you really need something specific, like that deep McCrag blue or that bloody Mephiston red, definitely consider checking out Games Workshop's stuff. 
it is very high quality, and I do think you get what you pay for overall. And that moves us along to the Army Painter Color Primers, and for a long time, this was our only real big alternative to the Games Workshop Citadel Primers, especially if you were looking for a more diverse or perhaps military-style color palette. And really, you can find this at almost any third-party game shop. They're pretty widely in stock around the country, and they do have a good color range. On top of all that, they are also only about $15 a can at most places, which is going to be about $5 or $6 cheaper than the Games Workshop stuff. And I think they are much more reliable when it comes to more earthy colors, like those grays and browns, which are just a bit off in the Games Workshop Citadel line. However, I will say this, the Army Painter color primer does tend to go on quite thick on a lot of models. And if you're not careful, you can really ruin your models by putting too much paint on them. Now, that's obviously the case with all color primers, but it's especially so with the Army Painter. I don't know what it is about this stuff, it just seems to go on super thick and often super glossy. And if you're using thinner paints like Vallejo, sometimes you're going to have to put on three to four thin coats just to get a solid coat on a model, which is just too time consuming and counteractive to the point of using color primers. But as I mentioned earlier, relatively recent to the release of this video, Vallejo did release their hobby spray paint color line, and here you're getting a great middle ground between the Citadel Primer and the Army Painter. This stuff goes on very, very thin and fine, much like the Citadel Primers. You're getting a great color range here, maybe even better than the Army Painter color range, especially if you are trying to do military models. If you look at their greens, they have almost every type for every faction that exists in World War II. It really is very impressive. And aside from Xandri Dust and Lead Belcher from Citadel, I have not bought another can of spray paint since. It's also worth noting that the Vallejo Color Spray is not only cheaper than the Citadel Primer, it's also cheaper than the Army Painter stuff, which is really quite amazing. Now, it does vary from color to color and even shop to shop from my experience, but you're often looking at price ranges from $11 to $14. And while it does feel like that the Vallejo cans don't last quite as long as the Citadel or Army Painter cans, I think that reduced price definitely justifies it. And really, I think the only drawback to the Vallejo primer at the moment is the fact that not too many retailers carry it, and it does get a little expensive if you're ordering it online with shipping. But since its release, I have seen it pop up in great numbers in hobby shops, and I've seen the inventory in those hobby shops expand over time. So I think this is going to become a mainstay, one that might box Army Painter out of its position in third-party hobby shops around the country. So of all the three, I would definitely recommend the Vallejo Hobby Spray the most out of any of these, but the other two options aren't bad, and having a can of Lead Belcher on your shelf is going to come in handy more times than one might think. But if you're just getting started, don't worry too much about that. Just find a Vallejo color that's going to match the predominant color of your army, and stick with that. And much like the last video when we looked over the first tools, I think these sprays are really the main thing that I'm going to dig my heels in on here. From this point on, it's going to require a lot of discretion on your behalf to understand what colors you're going to need for your army in order to get them painted. And while I can give you basic outliners on how to get started, this video is going to propose general guidelines, not a sediment set of rules that's going to apply to every person out there, as every person is starting off with a different type of model and game system. All of which, in turn, are going to demand their own color palettes and arsenal of paints. But when you do get started with this hobby, I do think it is a good idea to pick up a core paint set just so you have an auxiliary selection of paints to get started with. From there, you can build up your collection with the specific paints that you need and buy them as the time comes. But as far as core sets for paint goes, there's three options here and I would definitely recommend starting with at least one of them. And first up, we have the Vallejo Basic Color Set. And this is more or less just going to be a well-rounded palette of colors that you're going to find on the basic color wheel, and that's going to give you a nice variety of colors should you need them. With multiple warm and cool colors, along with black and white, it's also going to allow you to mix paints, which is definitely going to increase the overall utility of this paint set. However, mixing paints isn't exactly an elementary task, and it does require some knowledge of color theory to do it properly. But if that's something you are comfortable with and familiar with, this is definitely a great starter set for only $40. But my main complaint here is that you are going to be lacking a lot of more earthy tones in this set. 
And if you're painting more historical figures like Bolt Action, you're definitely going to want to get some more of those very, very specific browns and tans and greens, rather than have to find out a recipe and mix them every time you want to start painting. Still, for $40, it's definitely not a bad starter set, and it should serve you well if you're in a more fantasy-oriented setting like Star Wars or Warhammer. And after that, we have the Citadel Essentials box set. And I actually think this is a pretty great way to get started in the hobby, because you're not only getting a pretty decent selection of paints, you're also getting a free brush in there, you're getting some sprue clippers, which are absolutely necessary, and then you're getting a full-size thing of plastic glue. All for $40. However, the biggest drawback with this paint set is that it is oriented towards that Warhammer 40k 8th edition Ultramarines vs Death Guard, and some of the colors you're going to get in here are just way too niche and you're probably not going to find a whole lot of use for them. Games Workshop used to have a $25 version of the starter set that came with smaller pots but with more generic colors that were really nice to have on hand. However, there is also just some absolutely fantastic colors of paint in here, ones that you're not really going to find equivalents of outside of the Citadel line. And later when we do look at some additional paints I'm going to recommend you buy, you're going to see that a few of them are already in this box set. So if you are looking to lump your paint and tools into one box set and you're willing to pay a little bit of extra money for some extra paints that might not be in this set, then I definitely think this is the way to go. Especially when you consider that it comes with Agrax Earthshade, one of the most essential tools that every beginner should have in their hobby kit. Now that being said, while you are getting some really great colors in this set and some essentials, you're not getting that overall color variety that you're going to get by mixing the things in that Vallejo basic color set. So if you think you're going to be able to do blending and mixing colors well, and you really want a wide variety of paints for really cheap, I would say go with the Vallejo set. But if you want to pay more for those pre-mixed high-end paints that really have a unique color to them, this is definitely a good starter. And really, all things considered, there's nothing wrong with getting both of these box sets. It is going to cost you $80, which is a little bit pricier, but you're going to have a very malleable collection there. However, if you are getting into the hobby on a strict budget, and you need just the paints you need to get started and nothing else, I would definitely recommend going to Warlord Games and checking out their army paint sets. Now, these paint sets usually sit around $22, but can get up to $30 if they include more paints in them, and they're going to be a hand-picked selection of Vallejo paints that are going to correspond with an army's color scheme in the Second World War. Now, obviously, this is going to have less utility if you're not playing bolt action or historicals, but I think if you're playing something like Imperial Guard, or perhaps Rebels in Star Wars Legion, this is still a viable option. But I do want to make note that usually this isn't enough on its own. For example, I listed the Africa Core paint set there, which I did use for my Africa Core, but I still did need to buy other colors to get their skin painted, and I did need to buy another brown color to differentiate the leather of their boots with the wood on their rifles. On top of that, I ended up not really liking the green color for their jackets, so I did end up buying another Citadel paint pot to sub that color out. So while this is a cheap alternative to just getting exactly what you need to get started, you are going to need more than just these paints, and that will move us along to our next portion of this video, which is the essential paints. And these are paints that regardless of what core set you buy, you're going to need in your collection. Although, as I mentioned earlier, some of those starter sets do include items that are listed here, so there's a bit of overlay. Again, you just need to do your research, make sure you know what colors you need, and shop accordingly. But regardless of where you get them, I think these paints are something that everyone is going to need to have in their collection, at least when they're starting off. And the first on this list is, of course, going to be the very generic black and white. And with a pot of black and white paint, you can mix them together to make any shade of gray. You can also mix them with other paints to either bring them up or bring them down in colors, though you should be conscious of the temperature. And while you could go with Abaddon Black and Ceramite White from Games Workshop, I would recommend getting the Vallejo paints here because having them in dropper bottles means they're going to be a lot easier to mix. Games Workshop also has a little bit of trouble with white, where their Ceramite White tends to dry up and putty a lot quicker than their Vallejo counterparts. And there's definitely a conversation to be had as a whole about Vallejo versus Citadel paints, and Army Painter paints for that matter. Personally, I don't have any experience with Army Painter paints, and I don't really plan on picking any up, because why fix something if it's not broke? There's certain colors that I prefer to have in Vallejo, and there's other colors that I prefer to have in Citadel, much like Lead Belcher. But again, that's something that you're going to have to figure out on your own. 
I see a lot of painters completely dismiss Citadel, as they are more expensive and come with the relatively inferior pots, but I think they are high quality paints and they look great on models. And that will move us along to our next item on the list, and this is something that I am going to really put my heel down on, because I don't think there's any other washes on the market that give as satisfying results as the Games Workshop washes, and the two that I'm going to recommend that everyone has in their painting arsenal is Agrax Earthshade and Nuln Oil. Now, one of these, Agrax Earthshade, is going to be a brown wash, while the other one is going to be a black wash. And this is basically going to allow you to cover your models with a thin layer of wash paints that's going to settle in the recesses and really help bring them to life. I think discovering washes is one of the big kind of like Plato's cave allegories for hobbyists where they paint their models and they don't think they look good and then all of a sudden they put a layer of wash on them and all of a sudden all that detail comes to life and their perspective on painting and highlighting and shading is changed forever. And while a few other companies out there like Army Painter make other washes like the Dip, I think the Agrax Earthshade and Nulm Oil are very affordable, they're going to last you a long time, and if you use them right, they're not going to leave any unnecessary pooling or residue that I've seen some other washes on the market leave behind. In my opinion, and I'm sure I'm not alone on this, these are two absolutely must-have items. Just be sure when you're buying them to pick up the Shade variant and not the Gloss variant, which is likely going to give you a less desirable outcome. But next, we're going to move along to another item that I think is staple in every collection, and that is going to be Citadel's Metallics. Specifically, the Lead Belcher, the Stormhost Silver, and then the Retributor Armor. Metallics like these three are going to come up a lot in wargaming, especially when you consider how many games include figures with guns. And while I haven't used other Metallics from lines like Vallejo or Army Painter, I haven't heard the best things about them, and I'm not eager to switch off of Citadel. Especially with a color like Lead Belcher, which used to be Bolt Gun Metal, it's one of the best colors that's ever been invented for model wargaming, and most people who have picked up a brush for this hobby know of its existence. Stormhost Silver is also a very useful color to have. Again, this one used to be Mithril Silver. I'll be honest, if you're playing something like Historicals and you're not going to have those brighter silvers, you could probably skip this one, but it does make a really good highlight for the Lead Belcher. And if you really want something to kind of gleam like it's shining in the sun, this is the highlight that you're going to want to use. And lastly, we have the Retributor Armor, which is going to be more or less your standard gold color. And honestly, you'd be surprised how much this one shows up. In Bolt Action, I use it for ammo belts, for my medium machine guns. And in Star Wars Legion, you're going to use it for things like C-3PO, or some power couplings in those premium bases. It just comes up every now and then, and it's just great to have gold on hand. And the Retributor Armor really is a very vibrant and magnificent version. It also gets toned down very heavily when you wash it with Null Oil. So you can actually hit it with Null Oil and then use Retributor Armor again as its own highlight. I think it's a really solid color and you can get a lot of utility out of it. And from my knowledge of how paint works, it's very hard to get those metallic flakes down to a very fine level. So they work in an acrylic paint that goes on miniatures of this scale. And because of that, I think the Games Workshop ones are a premium worth paying for. They just look really dang good, and until you're getting into non-metallic metals, these will hold you over for quite some time. And lastly on this list, we are going to be looping around to something I talked about earlier, and that is getting a flesh tone for your minis. Now, with most non-Caucasian skin tones, you are going to be able to mix browns and tans together to get a relatively desirable effect. But without that peach color in your arsenal, it's really hard to get Caucasian skin tones by just mixing paints together. And I highly recommend you pick up a pot of the new Gilliman Flesh Contrast Paints from Games Workshop. I'm not exactly the biggest fan of contrast paints, but this is one that I'm definitely giving the seal of approval to. It's actually not the method I use to paint faces. I still do use my Cadian Flesh Tone with the wash of Reichland Flesh Shade and then go back over with a highlight of Cadian Flesh Tone or Kislev Flesh, and work them up with white until I have a desirable contrast. But that's definitely a more advanced blending technique. And if you're just getting started and you want to buy just one pot to get your flesh shades down, this is definitely the way to go. Just know that if you're using the contrast paint, you're not going to need to wash it afterwards. And I would definitely recommend avoiding washing Caucasian skin tones with Nuln Oil or Agrax Earthshade. They really do need a more reddish or pinkish tone, otherwise they start to look dirty and not so much like flesh. So those are going to be your essential paints there, and a lot of them are going to be Citadel paints. I think it's just a matter of quality, and when you're getting started, you're not really going to know how to size up other types of paints. 
and maybe get the best results out of them. So I think spending a few extra dollars on things like washes and metallics is going to take you a long way. And if you want to keep it cheap overall, I would consider going with Vallejo paints and most other categories. But really, it's going to be up to you to figure out what you like and what works best for you. And lastly, we are going to move along to our final section of the paint category, and this is going to be your sealants. And these are basically tools that are going to help protect your models or help you apply transfers to them without being damaged in the future. And I'll be quite honest with you, if you're just making plastic models and you don't plan on using transfers on them, you can kind of skip both of these. Although it's not a bad idea to varnish your models. And for our general spray varnish, we are going to have the testers dull coats. And this is a clear coat that's going to go over your models without applying too much sheen to them while still offering a protective layer. And for most plastic models, this should be perfectly acceptable for sealing in your paint and making sure it doesn't wear off, flake, or chip in the future. Now, if you used a solid primer, that's usually not going to be an issue anyways, but it is going to prevent things like grease wearing off the paints and prevent dust from permanently settling on your models. However, I will make note that if you are painting metal models, this is not going to be enough alone to seal them and make sure they don't chip. There's definitely a bit of irony when it comes to lacours, because the more glossy they are, the more protection they're going to offer. So personally, when I paint my metal models, I do use a clear coat of semi-gloss auto lacquer for them that's meant for model cars. And then after I've applied that high gloss coat, I spray them down with Tester's Dull Coat, which brings the gloss back down. They still are noticeably a little bit shinier, but that's the cost of protecting your metal models. But if you're going with plastics, you should be good with just the Dull Coat on its own. And these come in relatively smaller cans, they are cheap, but you will burn through them relatively quickly, so I would recommend picking up two or three every time you do so. And next, we're going to move along to our Dull Coat Lacour, which is a brush-on sealant. And you're going to use this when you're applying transfers, and once they're in the position you want them in, you need them to be locked in place. And that's exactly what this Lacour is going to do. However, make note that it is very potent stuff, and you will need to apply it with one gentle coat, otherwise you risk ripping the transfer. I will also mention that you should not use a brush that you care about. You should use one of your more destroyed brushes here because this is going to settle in the bristles and lock the brush up, making it unusable for painting. And I'll be honest, if you plan on varnishing your model almost immediately after applying transfers, you could skip this step, but I personally don't like risking it. I like putting this on there immediately when the transfers are dried and settled to make sure I don't accidentally lose them before the model is varnished. But if you are collecting plastic miniatures, and you are looking to start cheap, I will say that you can probably skip this sealant stage and maybe just pick some up down the road. Maybe even when you completely finish your army and you want to just get them all varnished at the same time. But with that final stage of the process finished, that is going to bring an end to my beginner's guide on how to get started with gathering your paints for your miniature wargaming army. Again, a brief recap. I recommend getting a color primer, preferably from the Vallejo line, although Citadel and Army Painter will also suffice. And then I would recommend grabbing a core paint set, be it the Vallejo basic color set, the Citadel Essentials box set, which is nice because it also includes extra tools, or just a small Warlord Army Painter set. Any of those selections is going to give you a nice small batch of paints in which you can build off of. After that, we are going to have our essential paints. That's going to be a black and a white, our two Citadel washes, some metallics from Citadel, and then a Caucasian flesh tone, which I recommend being the Gilliman Flesh Contrast Paint. And as I stated earlier, you probably are going to need to buy some other paints than this, but it's going to be up to your discretion, because every army is going to require different elements. And if you need further information, like how to paint Stormtrooper armor, there's plenty of videos out there on the YouTube that are way more specific than this general guide. This video, probably more so than the other two in this mini-series I'm doing, is a very, very subjective one, and it really is a hard thing to recommend overall, as so many people are going to have different needs in their hobby career, as the collection that they are working on is likely to change over time. But if you found this video useful, stick around for the next in this mini-series where we're going to look at the essentials for basing your miniatures, which is a necessary step that I think is often overlooked or considered an afterthought by people who are just getting into the hobby. But as always, if you want to see more content like this, go ahead and hit subscribe, consider turning on notifications, leave a comment if you have any other suggestions, much like the last video, this is a community effort, we're all building on top of each other, and sharing our knowledge here to help new people get into the hobby. And as always, until next time, take care.